started to enter into the actual meeting from the waiting room. And so let's see, it looks as though we have live guests. Are you there with me? Yeah, great to be here, thanks. Dan, let me give a brief introduction. It's, it, to me, having you on is, is sort of legendary status. It's really spectacular. I appreciate you taking the time to be a part of anything that we do for our clients. Um, but let me give a background for the people that may not have realized that they've read about you or read what you've spoken or heard what you've said on many publications. To all of our guests who are joining us from as near as Beverly Hills and as far as Florida and the rest of the East Coast and across the rest of the country, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it a lot. Um, I expect you'll find Dan to be both very entertaining and interesting, um, extraordinarily knowledgeable. By way of background, he is one of the most sought after global tech experts on the planet. He's been on Wall Street for more than two decades, covering software and broader technology sectors. He has a focus in enterprise and hardware, software as well, sectors including cybersecurity, cloud computing, and big data technology, even and including across the mobile landscape. He's been a keynote speaker across the US, Europe, and Asia, and he's a regular guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, BBC, ABC, CNN, and Fox Business, where he provides commentary related to his experience with technology. He's also cited around the world in publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today, Investor's Business Daily, the LA Times, the Telegraph, San Francisco Chronicle, Time Magazine, and the Washington Post, South China Morning Post, Barron's Financial Times, the Sydney Morning Herald, and the New York Times. It is a pleasure for me to be able to call Dan my friend, and it is extraordinary for you on a day like today to take time to visit with many of our clients. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah, it's great now, to be here. Thanks, I, I must say, Dan, I've always had in my practice the sensibility to say, when everything's wonderful and great, I will reach out to you, you reach out to me at your leisure. But when the world feels like it's falling apart, when it's starting to crumble, don't worry, I will run to you. There's no way I could have known today would have been the day where I need to run to everyone the fastest. But I'm so glad to have you on this call. So I'm going to let you um, start with some of the things that you think may be the most press, pressing issues, maybe and namely what's happening in and around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously, look, I mean, it, and also I want to make this as interactive as possible. So any questions, put them in the chat, email Jeff, Connor, you know, anyone from the team. I mean, look, I would, I mean, I've covered tech stocks since uh, late 90s. And, you know, I could count really on one hand the types of events that we've seen like this. Uh, you know, you go back to 9-11, financial crisis, Europe debt. And I think each one's different and each one's scarier, you know, for different reasons. I, I tell you right now, you know, being on the phone with institutional investors, you know, a lot of our clients, hedge funds, mutual funds, all last night, all this morning. I want to give some, there's some sort of tidbits, what, what I'm hearing, some thoughts and and then maybe I want to talk about sort of near-term ways to navigate this in terms of our view and our, play, and our playbook. Yeah, and just to be to clear, the institutional side, Dan, I think for our listeners, the fact that you have your sort of fingers on the pulse of what the institutions are saying, questioning, or wondering is relevant because they don't make reactionary decisions. They're more thought through with regard to what, what the future may behold. Yeah, so let's just, I mean, let's just start in terms of my view of 2022 has obviously been a disaster in terms of the risk trade, right? In terms of growth, I mean, bear market, tech stocks, you know, mostly down 20%, a lot are down 50, 60%. So, you know, this coming at this juncture, despite we could talk about what that does for the Fed, 25 or 50 bips. I mean, clearly it just adds to that risk off environment and now, I, I want to almost take a step back and look at fundamentally, if you look at tech today, the, the growth that we see over the next call it two to three years is stronger than we've seen since the mid 90s. Now, of course, work from home, collaboration, streaming, that will continue to sort of fade. But in terms of cloud, 5G, 
the chip cycle, cybersecurity, and in terms of what I view as next-gen technology spent along with electric vehicles, I, I view it as the strongest that I've seen, uh, you know, really going back to mid-90s with, with sort of the build up of the internet. So, you know, as that sort of backdrop, I mean, I'm not one in these environments that because of headline risk and because of the sort of nervousness, we just throw in the towel and say, okay, now's the time to just go defensive. Because I ultimately, in my career and with our clients, the best success stories, the best values, the best opportunities have been in the chaos and the carnage. So, you know, with that sort of being said, I think there's a few ways that I would navigate these coming days and weeks. One, you know, depending on how nimble you could be, I, I do believe the area that I, if you don't, if you don't leave with anything, it's this. Cybersecurity is going to be the subset of technology that significantly outperforms this year. Not just because of the growth trends that we're seeing in terms of the shift to the cloud, as well as heightened security threats that we're seeing globally. But now, I mean, when you add the Russia, Ukraine, I mean, we've already started to see from our contacts in the Beltway. And there's some news crossing right now, as well as some enterprises that could increase spending anywhere from two to 300 bips. Names that stick out, Palo Alto, Zscaler has been one of our favorites, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, Okta, Tenable. Um, and, and then there's names like Mandian as well. You know, there's a basket, and Jeff could hit you after. You know, you can either play with a basket where there's ETFs like Hack, you know, which is a cybersecurity ETF. I believe cybersecurity here are almost table pounders because we're talking about a lot of these stocks are down 30, 40, even some of the high growth names, 50%. And I think the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater. In other words, like I believe this is the subsector. If I don't leave you with anything, let it be this, that, that I would really be owning here um, given, given the trends. In terms of on the large cap, which and clearly large cap is going to outperform small cap during this volatile period, I look at names like Microsoft from a cash flow perspective. I mean, I believe relative to growth is the cheapest we've seen Microsoft in six years. Apple. That's, that, to- I, I want you to touch on that too, yeah. not to interrupt, but the value versus growth, where sure. are we in that cycle? But finish that thought first, please. But, but, but I just <clears> want to, <throat> because it's important, because it's very easy for me to be like, NASDAQ trades at a PE of 22, 21 times. Historically, it's traded at 19 to 20. It's still on the upper end. But again, it goes back to like most institutional investors, most of my conversations, you got to factor growth into the equation. So on a PEG, P-E-G, PEG basis, we're now trading toward the trough of the range over the last 15 years. We're trading a PEG about 1.1 to 1.2. And typically, if you look at the last, call it 15, 20 years in tech, the range is anywhere from one to 1.7. So why is it, why does it, why would that be? And how is that so when people feel like valuations are so rich, or at least they have been in the recent months? But it's relative to growth. It goes back to like, if I, in my career, if I always just stood there and focused on valuation, pure valuation PE, then we wouldn't have been bullish on Tesla, Netflix, Amazon. Facebook might. The, the point being is you have to, in these types of markets with transformational growth, you can't just look straight PE in terms of some of the growth trends. I believe that that's why I think the best way to do it is you got a basket approach. You got your cybersecurity, which I've used offensive and defensive names that are way oversold. I mean, just to start with. Then when you look on some of the mega caps, the Microsofts, the Apples, Tesla, remember, this is talking about relative to growth. It's cheapest we've seen anywhere from the last five to six years. Wow. And, and Jeff, it comes down to like, now, if you want to go conspiracy theory and be like, well, what happens if this causes China to then go after Taiwan? Remember, like, we, we can play that game. But in terms of like what's in front of us from a bell curve perspective and a risk profile, you know, I believe right now, like a lot of my institutional conversations, like more investors are looking for longs and how to play and what to buy in the rubble. than let's just say I'll compare it to like March 2020 with COVID, just hit the sell button, get out, buy gold, done, hide under the blanket. 
Yeah, this seems this seems like it will be an opportunity for investors when we're in an environment where all the factors seem to be lining up sort of against us, creating the lesser favorable circumstances. Inflation obviously is persisting with the recent numbers at seven and a half percent on an annualized rate with an interest rates scheduled to go higher. And some firms, JP Morgan says likely every meeting for nine consecutive meetings could increase. And then of course, Russia and Ukraine. So all of these work against the backdrop of a favorable circumstance for an investor. So let me just be clear, even though those create chaos and they may create opportunity for you as an investor, I think it's only appropriate that I say it now while we have an opportunity to make money, to have a better portfolio that's richer in value in the future than it is today, I also want to make sure that empathetically it is clear that our minds are also with the people of Ukraine who have a different sort of conviction about what they're hoping for for tomorrow. And we always want to make money, but from a humanitarian standpoint, we're thinking, we're thinking globally. Yeah, and but Jeff, I mean, to that point, of course, I agree with you, but there's a better chance of me playing in the Masters in April than there being hikes at every meeting over the next eight. I mean, the point is that's that what I want to hear also. Yeah, so, so let's just be clear like, what's happened. Like a 50 bit hike just got tossed off the table. So, so the point is, like, with Ukraine now, Fed's going to have to be a lot slower in terms of the rate hike, which obviously is positive for the 10 year, a net positive for tech. Now, Inflation hawks will say, all right, well, it still it doesn't change that dynamic. But I do believe that's why tech in some of these areas are maybe outperforming, especially in today's market. Yeah, I see that. Just to, just to, ju just to hit that. And also, look, I mean, I sat next to an economist for 10 years in, my, in the office next to me. So if I believed everything he said, I would have never owned equity since 2000. Ju just to, to, to level set there, right? So in these environments... All the haters come out, fire in a crowd theater, world's it. I get it. But that's why it just goes back. Why we're doing something like this is just let's focus on fundamentals. The broader market growth, Ru Russia's less than 0.002% of global IT spend. That's, now, that's course, the kind of conversation and talking points the guests, I want them to hear, need to hear, uh, and are relevant. Thank you. Well, it's important because... Now, you could be like, well, no, but, but, but Russia is going to cause higher oil, which then is going to cause a risk off. And you're, remember, it goes back to like when you go into these geopolitical, I'll call them black swan events, I think you got to be careful in terms of trying to peg the risk. And you got to put some base case and best case and worst case scenarios. But it goes back to from a portfolio perspective, like, you want your free cash flow stories, names like Cisco, Checkpoint, Fordnet, some of the chip players like an Intel, which I think, you know, continues to sort of fit that bucket. But you want to have the offensive portfolio, too, because I believe we look back at these periods as more of the opportunity rather than, wow, market was telling us something and we were just going lower. Well, you mentioned chip makers. I think that's sort of a hot button that every one of our clients is aware of. Even if they're not thinking about their own products, they know that certain car manufacturers had to stop putting the heaters in the seats, that the delay to receive certain product is so much longer. Where are we with maybe a combination of the supply chain and also chip manufacturers and chip makers? Well, yeah, I mean, but just think about like we're coming off a once in a hundred year pandemic and it's the worst supply chain shortage in the last 40 years. So, you know, obviously unique environment, but from a supply chain perspective coming out of Asia and we do checks basically every week, it's actually moderating going into okay. March, April, May. Now, some will be like, okay, well, Russia, Ukraine, does that potentially negatively impacted because it may be some of the material that goes into the chips. 5% of chips material come out of Ukraine. They've been, most, most chip makers have already diversified their supply chain. So chips, AMD specifically, Micron is a cash flow name, Marvell is a 5G play, 
um, you know, and, and as well as even Intel, like I talked about, is sort of that sort of basket approach and value is, is the way to play chip. I mean, when I look at NVIDIA below 200 bucks, unless you believe the chip cycle is ending, then that's a significant risk reward that I want to own. Yeah. But, but, it, but, but it, all, it all goes back to like, this is not going to be a Cinderella story and roses and champagne over the coming days and weeks. But it's these environments that create the opportunity, right? At Tesla at 1100 felt like it's going to 1400 Now it feels like it's going to 500 and no one wants to own it. Yeah, okay, people but- have a funny way of remembering that which happened last. They remember best and sort of forget and don't have the perspective that they, they could have. Just with that example is perfect. But that's why, but Jeff, that point, like it all comes down to just growth and fundamentals. And like, I've been, you know, fortunate enough in my career to break bread with, you know, Job and Cook and Ellison and Bomber and all, you know, Gates and everyone. And it's given me perspective because- Just to be clear, ad- Steve Jobs of Apple, Bill Gates of Microsoft, uh, just wanted to make sure some of these names are, you know, who you do break bread with or have, they're the top tier within their organizations in case those are household names for the guests. Yeah. Well, I think part of it, and, and there's other, and obviously CEOs, you know, every week that we're, you know, interacting with, I think sometimes, especially early on in my career, I was so near term focused. Okay. Well, what, when's the product coming out? What, how, how come you miss that quarter? How come you, okay. But I think what I've learned from my interactions over the decades is just a much more of a, holistic view and and i think we're going into a transformational growth period i mean that's the it's very important to just keep stress now like it's a fourth industrial revolution that's not changing because of a ukraine conflict now again it goes back to like how, whatever degrees of separation you you want to take this out but geopolitical like if you go back over the last 30 years, basically every time they've been a time to buy stocks rather than sell. Mm-hmm. Now, of yeah. course, if I now, now get on the skeptical and I can tell you investor conversations, but no, there's never been uh, one Europe and of course, Russia involved and gas and oil and what could happen in the environment. That's fine. But every, but I could go back to Greek debt prices, 2011, 2012, where we're trying to pound the table on tech stocks. Everyone's like... Europe's going to go bankrupt. And then once they go bankrupt, the U.S. banks hold the European debt and then they're going to go. And then the financial crisis of 2009 is going to happen again, 2011, 2012. So I'm just saying, like, if you want to play that game, we could keep going back there. But that's why, like, Jeff, that's why we're doing something like this, because I think it's important to not just be pie in the sky, but just be like, look, these are the names you own. This is how you navigate it. And, 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 and I think you need levels too, in terms like there's some need, like today, like if you look at tech today, at one point, like tech really started a rally because it's gotten to what I view as the most oversold that I could remember since 2015. Now, what do you think? It may stay at levels like this, but it still could create a really attractive buying opportunity. Look, it goes back to like anyone that, a f- tries to call a bottom there's more cemeteries with those people than heroes right <laughs> so but but i view it as like we are getting to a point here from a valuation perspective that in less like super black swan type horrific derivations of this happen we look back on this and be like had these stocks get to these levels and why now, like when you explain it, it will be like, well, no, that was if you like from a historic, like, well, no, right. What happened there is it was Ukraine, and everyone thought they're like, well, had it go back up, you're like, well, there was a summit, and you know they split Ukraine, whatever. I mean, whatever it ends up happening. I'm just trying to make a point that like I don't try to be a, you know, on the history channel and try to do some like geopolitical sort of predictions, but just in my 
history, these have been these have really been more opportunities in terms of the exogenous shock events. Yeah. Especially given what we see in terms of the consumer and in terms of growth. That's so, it's just an important dynamic. So maybe that's the right next step is, of course, geopolitical uncertainty can create opportunities in the market. It may dislocate. It's down several hundred points, not just today, but in recent days, partly because of that. But if we exclude that inflation and interest rates rising, those are the two drivers that have really sort of kicked off 2022, making it less wonderful than it otherwise would be. What well, about course, just keeping those into context? Look, in context, it's like, well, first of all, it just comes down to like, oh, the last time we came out of a once in a hundred year pandemic. Like, I'm just saying, yeah. it's like, oh, the last time we came out of a once in a 40 year supply chain. So th- we're going to go through this, like, the party's over, Fed's not accommodating. The- but it goes back to like, in this environment, that that whole Fed story, just to be clear, just got just got taken off the table. So yeah. most of my conversations with investors is not that you, like no one wanted this situation, but I'm just trying to say like the Ukraine situation has significantly changed the course of the Fed policy over the next, especially in 2022. Yeah, I think that is easy to digest. It's funny, three, not funny, but it's, the reality. Three weeks ago, we were talking about all these rate hikes, four or five rate hikes from the Federal Reserve were priced into the market. Not long after that, about a week after that, his inflation number showed up at seven and a half percent. The new and concerning element was maybe that next rate hike is going to be 50 basis points. And maybe it is, but it's with this third piece of relatively significant information, that story does change. That storyline shifts. Also, a significant piece of the inflation factually is coming from the supply chain and logistics shortage globally. And that's why it's, an, it's important to note that in all the chaos here, the supply chain issues are actually moderate. And that's yeah. an important dynamic for chips. And that's why it's our view, like, I think chips are mispriced here. I believe we're going into just a massive cycle when it comes to not just 5G, but especially AI and a lot of other technologies. You look at electric vehicles, go back to the numbers. I mean, it's 2% of automobiles today in the US. And yeah, so let's make this more fun. Talk about the electric vehicle, the autonomous driving, the sort of reality that what was once just Tesla for a household name now may become Rivian, may include Lucid, Mm -hmm. but also Audi and every other sort of manufacturer from Ford to General Motors playing in that space. Well, EVs, it's the biggest transformation to the auto industry since 1950s. So, so we're seeing just a huge dynamic that's taking place here. Now, originally, it was Tesla that really owned the market, and they still do 85% market share. But now you're seeing the likes of Ford, GM, VW, and others go after EVs because you know, we think it's going to be, today it's 2%, we think it's 10% by 2025. 25% of automobiles will be EVs by 2030, which is my belief that, like, as much as we talk about software and chips and some of the large cap names, I mean, you have to own EVs because, and it's not just Tesla. I think there's re-rating names like Ford that's starting to going to start to get re-rated on EV. I think GM. And then I think there's names like, I mean, like Rivian. I mean, go back to Rivian. Like Rivian's a stock here where they're going to transform the pickup truck and lifestyle vehicle that we're seeing play. I mean, they're just announced another plant coming out of Atlanta. And that's one where like, it's going to take a year or two for them to grow into the valuation. But you look at a name like Rivian, that's a name that you could start to nibble at in these types of risk off environments. Right. I mean, I think, and you look at names like Elucid is another one. There's, there's supply chain plays, like a lie cycle, which is an electric, which is an EV recycling play. So, you know, and then and then really like the chair on top of the Sunday is gonna be FSD, full self-driving, because that's right. something where 
when we start to get to level four, Tesla, you know, continues to be way ahead. Obviously, Waymo, you know, which is the Alphabet Moonshot project, and some others, Aurora, are, are significantly ahead. But FSD is going to be real, you know, over the yeah. next four, five, six years, and it's an important trend that. I think when you think about longer term investing, you, you, you need some exposure to that, in my opinion. The, I, yeah, I appreciate that. The, um, the full self-driving is almost like hard to get your arms around. Even if you've used it, you can see how well it works, but you also see the obvious imperfections that still exist. The, the reality is, though, we're moving closer to that than we are backwards. And when you say this is a revolution – it really feels like it. It's like from a horse drawn chariot to the automobile. Like we are, we're making massive advancements in that space right now, especially when you see fuel at $6 a gallon out here. Well, and that's the other thing. I mean, and look at Europe. I mean, I think if this thing has taught us anything from a fossil fuel, you know, there'll be a big debate, but it's like over the, it's going to accelerate the shift to EVs. Because it comes mm-hmm. down to like the less reliant we are there, especially given what's happened with oil and gasoline prices. I think that's a, it's an important dynamic. But it goes back to go back years ago, right? Some would argue, almost getting into a fist fight, that blockbuster video is going to continue to be the king. Netflix cannot believe that they're focused on the streaming. Remember, stock got hit 50% when they announced going to streaming away from the mountain. So I'm just I'm just trying to give an example of I love it. It's it's all now again, there still is a blockbuster video. I think it's like somewhere in the northwest, but I think there's one store left. Actually, good as a side of really good Netflix documentary on the, the blockbuster video. But I, I just think it's important in terms of the dynamics that are going on in this market. Where I mean, my you know, it's like when you start to get into the Uber and the, the first thing the guy says is, can't believe this market. I mean, it's usually like in the near term, a sign of a bottom. Let, let me remind guests. I know we have many people listening across the country and even some in Europe. If you would use the chat button at the bottom of the screen that you can click on and you can type a message directly to me, to Jeff Runyon, or to Dan Ives, and we'll make sure that we include it in this dialogue. This is a, this is a meeting that's designed for your benefit. I, I have had the recent lucky pleasure of having uh, a visit with Dan at a wealth management conference, even as recently as two weeks ago, and we talk a lot, and it's super fun for me, but I know how special it is to have him on the line. So any questions that you have for him, please share them. Yeah, and the goal, this is as interactive as possible. There, I mean, just like, names, commodity, whatever it is, you know, because I, just, and obviously like, you know, again, it goes back to like Jeff and I did not plan to, to officially have this on uh, the first conflict in Europe since World War II. That was not the goal when we uh, planned the date. Yes. Um, Dan, while you mentioned 5G, 5G had a lot of attention in the last year, AT&T and Verizon being names that feel like they might have benefited from it. And AT&T is clearly a name that hasn't done that well. And I know that there's questions about 5G, 5G ultra wide. The FAA slowed that down, even paused it for its launch in the beginning. And then concurrently, I see and read that 3G is being phased out. So it's like Mm -hmm. what was new technology is disappearing literally right before us. And this newer technology, 5G ultra wide, is happening so fast that some of these agencies can't get their arms quite around it yet. Yeah. And I also think, like, Jeff, on that point, I think like 5G, like the best way to play 5G yeah. is, is I, I still think Qualcomm is a, just a phenomenal way to play it on the chip side. I think Apple continues to be the best way to play it on the smartphone side. And, and I do believe, like, when you look at, like, the carriers, specifically, um, you know, specifically Verizon, I think they, from a bit, from a 5G build-out is probably the one that could could really benefit when we look at ultra-wide and, and, and a lot of the sort of build out, especially on the East Coast. I mean, look, 5G, 5G is going to give birth 
to a whole nother ecosystem of applications and technologies that we'll see over the coming years. I mean, a lot of it, like when you look at some of the technology coming out, especially on the, you know, on the automotive side, there's names like a ticker name, a Ouija, which is a big data automotive play. I mean, I think, I think one of the more unique companies, moats that I've sort of seen over the coming years. And I think and a lot of that is 5G driven, a lot of that is a full self-driving in terms of more and more of that technology. Um, and, and I think another sort of tangential trend is when you go into space. Now, I'm not talking about space travel, Virgin Galactic, consumer. More and more, you see more satellite driven technology that's being used in big data. Uh, helping companies on a on a big data perspective because you know it, it really it, it enables translate that a bit further if you would. So what that basically means is that by having satellite technology, okay, you're able whether it's agriculture, whether it's uh, ESG, whether it's civil, whether it's enterprises, you're able to get a lot more data in real time that companies, transportation companies, automobile companies could use that they can never get access to. There's a company, yeah. And I was just gonna say like, there's a company called Planet Labs, which is a name that like, I view as probably the best way to play that trend. Because I think it's important when you think about these trends, my pet peeve is like when I, I hear someone talk and they're like, the best trend is blah, blah. And they don't have a, a way to play it. It, it, it. The point is like you need ways to play the trend. And I think Planet yeah. Labs, in my opinion, is probably one of the best ways to play that trend. So I have a question from a listener. And it's with the rise in the interest and use of electric vehicles, is there anyone out there addressing the recycling or the disposal of the batteries when they wear out? and or when they need a replacement? Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's a great question. That, and the best pure play way to play that is Lycycle, cycle L-I-C-Y. They, they are the number one EV recycling play in the United States. And, and I think, and that's why it's one, like when you look at EVs, I think ways to play EVs is not just the OEMs. A lot of times everyone talks about the OEMs. And of course, there's the commercial plays, but supply chain. Yeah, I'm getting, thank you for that, Dan. I'm getting another question. And so I'm listening and reading at the same time. Uh, One of the questions is, what are top changes that you might want to make in the investment strategies based on what's happening right now in this shifting Mm -hmm. dynamic? Okay, so I think work from home names, high multiple names where growth is moderating, that's catching a falling knife, in my opinion. Names like DocuSign, Zoom, you know, you go through some of the, I mean, Facebook, I wouldn't get anywhere near because there's Apple, iOS changes. That stock's cheap. That's just no different than like, okay, like, some places selling pizza for a dollar, it's cheap, but I might end up in the hospital after I eat it. So I, I, cheap is always a dangerous term. I think Facebook's a business model crusher in terms of what's happened there. But I view huh? like a lot of the work from home, a lot of the e-commerce names, the GoDaddies, you look at some of the, you know, you look at what, what happened with eBay, you want to stay away from, much more as a portfolio, you want to steer clear of more, we'll call them like the work from home, pull forward names. And, and, and I think it's dangerous sometimes when you look at a chart and be like, stock was 100, it's 30, cheap. But look, right. the business model might be structurally broken. So that stock could get halved two more times. Mm-hmm. But you want to focus. So I think you... You start to steal clear, continue to steal clear of those, focus more and more on enterprise, cybersecurity, cloud-driven. I mean, let's just talk about cloud. I mean, think about cloud. Let's talk about cloud a little bit. We haven't mentioned Amazon. 
forty percent of workloads in the world are in cloud. In the next two years, that's going to seventy percent. So how do you play those trends? That's why Microsoft's core name Yoon. That's why Amazon on some of the parts basis, that's a name that continues to be defensive. Many would talk about on the e-commerce side, but the cloud business in Amazon, I think is worth 60, 70% of what the stock's worth today. Repeat and that. then you look at names like Google, look at GCP, it's going to be 20 billion in cloud revenue. I think IBM is a potential re-rating name because of cloud. I think Oracle is a cloud-driven name that has defensive characteristics. Because it goes back to like more and more enterprises are moving to cloud. That's not pull forward work from home. We're talking that's an accelerated digital transformation. We have clients on this call that are actually employed with and been with Oracle for decades. Um, it's it, it's sort of interesting and reassuring to hear from some other outside analysts what your remarks are when they're sort of in-house seeing it live and how much that demand is increased but oracle is a good example of like let's just talk about like palo alto and oracle mm -hmm. they're both examples of companies that had huge install bases went through growth challenges but now there's a renaissance of growth because of cloud and it doesn't have to be perfect even if it's 10 15 percent conversion the stocks get re-rated and i think oracle and palo alto both because of cash flow because of their install base because of valuation their safety blanket names right right um i had i had a couple of other thoughts when we talked last we talked about situational awareness when we're at a meeting like this what do you feel like that means from now looking forward we have plenty in our situation that's very dynamic and shifting quickly i think situational awareness is I'm not going to do this session, you know, with, with all your, with you and obviously all your clients, and just talk like I would be talking two months ago about trends. Right. Where you got, I think, situation awareness is just the world is different today than it was 24 hours ago, and you got to adjust, pivot, and ch make changes based on that. And I think that's why I think it's very important from a data point perspective. And obviously it's unique because we get a lot of different data points. It's important to understand the lay of the land, what's overdone, what you own, and maybe what are head fakes. Because like in these environments too, like you get head fakes, right? Like all of a sudden, like we wake up tomorrow, NASDAQ futures is up 3%. There was some erroneous report about, you know, it's a ceasefire. I'm just giving an example. And then all of a sudden it was just a head fake. Yeah. And, and, and situational awareness too is that in these, in these periods, you know, weekends are news flow. Sunday night when futures open up at six o'clock, you got to drink a lot of red wine, cognac, or, you know, whatever you like to do when those futures come up. Because, you know, it's that type of, to buckle the seatbelt period. It's nerve but again, it comes down to like, you know, own, own then go to cash and lose 7% on your, you know, on your cash, given the inflation. Yeah, so with inflation. It's, it's all, look, it's all, but it's all based on like, and Jeff knows the story, like a month, I remember out of this pre-Ukraine, like what, three weeks ago, or whatever, four yeah. weeks ago. I'm going to like West Coast. And, and some woman next to me, like older woman, like, you know, and I'm sitting there on my AirPods. She hits me on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, do you need help with anything? She's like, no, I'm sorry to bother you, but should I sell tech stocks now? I'm like, well, I'm like, well, first off, you got to consult your financial advisor and it depends on your risk profile. <laughs> but I'm just trying to give a highlight of like the nervousness in this environment, but it comes down to like, in nervousness, in chaos, creates opportunities. When everything is going up and to the right, I could get one of my two dogs upstairs and bring them down. They could do the webcast. I mean, like, yeah. So I'm just trying to yeah. explain, like, like my, put it this way, I had 15 clients call last night after seven o'clock because of this. Mm -hmm. Last week, 
It was zero clients calling. Yeah. Like I'm just trying to say like in these environments, it just, it's breeds the hand holding. Yeah. And if you liked names three or four weeks ago to not like them now at a lower price, it's hard to make a case that that makes sense unless it's materially because of one of these events. But that's why you got to break down the that great break down. It's like today, it's like have the growth drivers for Apple changed. What about the valuation? People still buy an iPhone. What's the consumer environment? Has supply chain changed? Now I could tell you like to my Twitter, you know, I'll get like hate mail and people will be like, well, no, you can't be bullish on Apple because now this is going to, this could cause China to go after Taiwan, which would then ruin the, Look, if you want to go down, consp- the point is like you're always going to have all different um, variables. I like to look in the base case and protect myself and rather than being like the fifth derivative. Because I think that's just oh. – sometimes I think it's, it's just – it's a dangerous game on both bullish and bearish when you go, you know, down that – I mean, just like three months ago, like I talked to somebody, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm quitting my job to trade Bitcoin. I'm like, whew. Yeah. And what do you think about it since you mentioned it? I think it's scary to correlation with tech stocks. I mean, mm-hmm. let's just go back. Like the whole goal was Bitcoin was going to be gold-like. It was going to be a hedge. The fact that Bitcoin is trading in R squared of like almost one with tech, it's concerning. And I think yeah. it also shows like how much weak hands and a lot of guys, you know, a lot of people getting called up on leverage. And I think you're seeing that trade unwind. Yeah. Um, I almost always just with everyone that's on this call know that I'm less often going to talk about commodities and currencies in general, even though we're in a period of time with oil that that can easily become a topic of conversation. But in 21 years of being in this business, I don't ever have a period in time when I recommended buy the Australian dollar, buy the Iraqi dinar, buy the euro, Japanese yen. So it's not likely that I'll be in the camp to tell you to go out and buy a lot of cryptocurrency. It could be something that's real that continues, but you have to understand the risks that accompany it and the money that we manage for people. Typically they're not interested in that level of volatility. Well, and also it's important what's happened today Mm. because in the most volatile shock event, I mean, you could say since COVID started March 2020 or from an event perspective, I mean, you could start going back to like Iraq War 9-11 and others. Like if you start to look at Black Swan events. Yeah. Okay. How did Bitcoin trade today? Yeah. Right. And I think that was a concern in terms of just from a correlation perspective. Right. Um, any other questions from guests? I see one comment that uh, in addition to the recycling play, Redwood Materials in California just began recycling EV batteries. Any familiarity with that? Yeah. And that's small. Um, in terms of that relative to life cycle. Yeah, but that's a good company. And they've still, and I think there's many that have started to go down that path. It's just mm-hmm. as a pure play, life cycle. I mean, they have they have a monster factory in Rochester. Like that, to me, there's going to be others like Redwood and others, but I'm saying life cycle is more of a pure play and they're already at scale. Yeah. Um, And just to be clear, in a call like this, there's no motivation. Conflict of interest do not exist. So it doesn't matter if you buy, whether you do or you don't, there's no motivation from Dan or from me. I just want to make sure we have all the content in front of you. Um, you, We've covered tons of material, Dan, and I appreciate it a ton. I made a promise to all of the people that we sent an invite to that I would try to keep it short enough that you would be interested to stay tuned, but just enough that you would absolutely gain knowledge and or content in being a part of this session. If there are any other questions, please, please send me an email or add it to the chat. But otherwise, oh, wait, I might have one more. Hold on. Yeah. And and also, if anyone wants to reach me, uh, D.I.V.S. Tech on Twitter or uh, I'm on LinkedIn, too. I think we've covered almost all of these. One other client has a question, had three questions, but the final of the three, if we're looking five to 10 years out, where should we be looking in terms of investment? And we may have already iterated some of it, but maybe echo it. 
and knowing there can and will be ups and downs during those windows. Like one of, one of my favorite questions from a client, even a couple of years ago, always wants to know from an innovative standpoint, what do the next 10 years look like? I think it's three buckets, software, chips, EVs. Like, I mean, very simply, I mean, that's really the three buckets that you put it in. You pick your own name based on your, your own basket based on risk profile. Those are the three, three buckets. I love it. Dan, anything else I should have asked that I haven't? No, look, I mean, I hope this helped everyone. It's obviously, it's a crazy time and that's why we, we do this. And, um, you know, I appreciate everyone being on and, and spend time. Dan, it's my pleasure. You don't know how much I appreciate it. I'll look Thank forward you. to seeing you again in soon, a real, real soon in person. Thank you. See Thank you. Thanks to all of our guests who joined us. Uh, just another opportunity for us to be in front of you and hopefully continue to bring value. Like I mentioned at the beginning, in periods of crisis, we will run to you. We will always try to make sure we're making the best decisions based on your financial goals and objectives. And even if you heard a name here today that's really interesting for you, it may or may not be the right addition to the portfolio. It's always determined on risk tolerance. So with that said, it's been a pleasure. I'll look forward to talking to you by phone or in person or on Zoom, whatever works best, and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.